Does Batman eat bats? If counting sheep makes you tired, what happens when you count wolves? All of these questions you can find the answer to on this, this paranormal, paranormal life. Wow. <laughs> so, something. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, a bit of a... Should we take another go with that? Or are you all right? No, I think we're going to leave that one as it is. Really? That's the best you got in you? Yeah. Today? I feel great today. I'm at 100%. You don't look at 100%. I'll tell you that much. I'm at a, I honestly think I've never been healthier in my life. You are right off the bat covered in band-aids. Right. So there's some sort of wound situation I was situation feeling cold. Going on. All right. It's got nothing to do with my health. You're feeling cold, so you put plasters. And on I your resent body? the accusation, sir, because I've actually never been sick a goddamn day in my life. Okay, well, that's a lie because right now you're ill as all hell. Sure, I'm a little under the weather, but that doesn't necessarily mean I have a cold. Of course, that means you're you're sick. You so you know you have a cold. I don't. I didn't say I had a cold. I said I was under the weather. Okay. All right. And it hurts to talk because my throat feels like. F sandpaper okay my let, head is let killing me, me okay i nose um, blocked nose blocked of course what are you a wizard or something how do you know this <laughs> okay <laughs> oh jesus oh oh vomiting up blood there pal i think it's a little bit more than a cold you got uh welcome to this paranormal life the only podcast hosted by two men at the peak of physical health okay every single week in this week's episode we have another listener submission Ooh, that's right kieran barker emailed in to this paranormal life podcast at gmail.com and he had a little case that was pretty close to heart that he wanted us to investigate hmm. now he said hi guys i've been absolutely beasting your podcast at work over the last couple weeks totally love your content it's funny and some of it gets you thinking i've got some weird experiences i thought i'd just share with you you never know who else has had something similar kieran I decided to look into your case because you had a couple good stories. One of them in particular I found incredibly fascinating. Wow. And that's the one we're going to be looking into today. Kieran wrote, I'm a personal trainer from Edinburgh. I've never really seen anything extraterrestrial except strange flashes in the sky and what I thought were satellites moving at stupid speeds only to totally change course. That's, that's pretty up there. Yeah. I mean, that's about as high as it gets. <laughs> I've only shaken hands with a grey. I've never made out fully with one before. I've never had a close contact of the first kind, which is, I think, uh, having sex with the grey. We never got that far. Second base only. Obviously, I have no idea what I was watching, so I can't pin it to anything specific. There's one thing that I can remember. So clearly, it feels though it only happened a few weeks back, but this happened around six years ago. I was out with a mate about 2 a.m., we used to walk to the 24-hour pure gym at stupid o'clock because we had no life. And while we were almost home, walking by a place called Gypsy Bray by Cramond Beach, we were passing by this small fenced-off wasteland that we would pass every night on our route home and always spook each other out by saying stuff like, oh, imagine looking in there and seeing a small girl. Anyway, as we were walking by, we were so deep in conversation, we never even realized we were passing it. As we were just about to pass the area, we both heard what I can only describe as the sound of a wooden pallet being dragged rapidly across the ground, forward towards us. We both started to instinctively sprint. We looked back and saw something in the darkness as we ran. It was only once we stopped and nearly passed out from sheer adrenaline and fatigue that we each described what we saw both of us seeing the exact same thing. Inside the empty wasteland, somewhere between the fence and the darkened trees, we each saw a pale white figure. Ooh. It was standing up from a crouched position, and it had no recognizable face, no clothing by the looks of things. If I could describe the height from what I saw, it would be somewhere between six, seven, and seven foot. It was once we stopped to sit down that there was a flash in the sky as if lightning had just struck. But there was no storm, no thunder, it was a clear sky. To this day we have no idea what we saw, and for obvious reasons we don't tell people about it because we would be ridiculed. <laughs> Even my parents thought I was full of shit trying to get attention. So that's an interesting... Wow! story to get emailed what a roller coaster yeah because we get emailed a lot of stuff you know we get there's a, there's a whole spectrum right of paranormal submissions you know we get emailed 
uh, I've been abducted. I'm on the ship now. Help. Yeah. And then we'll also get one the next day that's like, I think my, my dog barked weird. I think he's a gray. Yeah. You know? Like, so- like I, I bought a sandwich at the deli and it, 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 it went off a bit quickly. It doesn't seem right to me. I think it's space sandwich yeah. or something. Yeah. So this is a nice slap bang in the middle uh, case. Well, no, it's actually pretty far towards the it's end. It's pretty far towards the first one. Yeah. He saw the Terminator crash, <laughs> <laughs> crash to Earth. So yeah, I'd say this is more in line with help. I'm being abducted right now. Yeah. But it does seem uh, significantly grounded in reality. Yeah. Lots of little details in here. Um, that really make uh, this case stand out amongst the others. Now, he goes on to write, Here's where my story took quite a drastic turn. So maybe a year or so had passed. I hadn't been near that area since, but I was doing the exact same thing with another friend of mine. We were walking by the exact same area, and as I was about to tell my friend what I had seen a year ago, he started to tell me, this story about him and his friend and when they were down at the beach one night he said they were down Kremen beach around midnight only about a mile down the shore to where i had seen the white thing in the trees hmm. they were sitting on a wall when they heard some branches snap in the small forest behind them they assumed maybe it was some sort of lost junkie or something <laughs> that had randomly ended up in the bushes they sat in silence looking at the trees to see if they could see anything when they caught a glimpse of what he claimed was a tall, pale, white figure with no clothes, no face, around seven foot, walking through the trees. What? I never mentioned what I'd seen to this friend in case he thought I was a nut job. Once he told me his story, I told him mine. We both kind of stayed silent for a few minutes, realizing we weren't seeing shit. And we did in fact see what we thought we had. It sounds like Slenderman, but we all know that's bullshit. We have no clue what we both saw, but it still gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. Crazy. This is insane. This is a real life version of the, so you've seen it too. Yeah, this is crazy. Wow. I mean, what you're, what you're looking at here, folks, is the start of every good friendship. How do you think me and Kip became friends at Harvard Paranormal? Right. It was like day one before I I told you. Well, we had a bit of a different relationship because I told you about my experiences that I had had in Dublin. Yeah, and I didn't talk to you for three, I think it was almost graduation by the time I wanted to speak to you again after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which hurt my feelings a little bit, but obviously, as we know, I'm sure you had a lot on. You wanted to focus on your studies. Oh, really? It was actually... focus. There was almost no contact time. Yeah, I was actually pretty free. You're... Okay. Well, well, I guess I I had things on. I was busy anyway, yeah. so it was fine. Okay. Well, there was like a couple times I called you and you said you were busy, so it's weird hearing that you weren't because you told me that you were. Well, I was busy not hearing about the story. Right, okay. Which actually took up, actually, looking at my calendar, that was almost all of my time was, was not listening. not listening to that story, avoiding that story. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Because like on my birthday, I invited you to my birthday mm-hmm. where I ordered all those pizzas. Right. Like 300 pizzas. Because yeah. I saw you eat pizza on day one and I was like, he obviously likes pizzas. I mean, not 300. If I ordered, I thought if I ordered a bunch of them, you'd come to the party. It's um, not, I mean, like if you ordered me one pizza, I wouldn't have come. Right. 299 more pizzas doesn't change. Well, I didn't know what your favorite flavor was. Okay. So I got them all. Is there 300? No, there wasn't. I actually added, a, I made up a bunch of ones for myself. Doubled up on a couple. Sure. Yeah. Pepperoni, double pepperoni, pepperoni and marbles. That one was terrible, but not for the reasons you think. They had the marbles uh, were great. The pepperoni, so so. Pepperoni was incredibly <laughs> stale. Staler than marbles? <laughs> the glass? They said they had four different optional toppings, and I said, give me every variation, which turns out is over 300 possible combinations of pizza. It was it was crazy. It was all three years of my student loans <laughs> gone on one pizza party, which would have been fine if anyone had f***ing showed up. Right. But I was eating marble pizzas for months after that. But the point standing that uh, sometimes by meeting someone through difficult circumstances or some some sort of traumatic experience, you can form a strong bond. Yeah, and look at us now. Be- like, best friends, like, blood brothers. Well, friends, yeah. Bonded Def- for definitely. life. Yeah, like, buddy, like, acquaintances at least. Sure, like, the best acquaintances. Well, Kieran, you're my friend, and you've got nothing to worry about. You'll be happy to find out that you're not alone. What? I came across... Dozens of accounts of people coming in contact with these quote-unquote tall whites. Dozens of accounts? 
imagine this, all right? It's 1 a.m. I get okay. this email. There's a thunderstorm outside. Sure, I've, there's I've, a white in the yard. <laughs> I got a, I got a pot of black coffee and a lit cigarette in my mouth. I hear this, this phrase pop up now and again, tall whites, tall whites. I do a couple Google searches. Next thing I know, news article comes up. Reddit thread comes up. YouTube video comes up. I'm being bombarded. The cigarette falls out of my mouth. Sure. My God, I say. I've stumbled onto something massive. You turn to your assistant and better get a couple of marble ronies in here. <laughs> We're gonna be here all night. User Zanny Manny said, I was walking towards a stream to meet with my dad around 5 p.m. As I was walking, I heard a twig break. I looked to my left and saw a tall being, maybe seven foot, sprinting. It looked sprinting? Sprinting. Athletic? It looked skinny and very white. It was running way too fast to be human. Jesus Christ. User Rockstead said, seen one of these things many years ago. I ran for my life. Now I wish I went up to it. Very tall, long legs and arms and a big head. User Bubbles420 even went as far as saying, these ones abducted me in 2000. <laughs> what? They got up close and personal. Way too close and personal. This thing is widespread. So it's international. It's not located to Edinburgh, didn't you say? I did, yeah. Kieran, what you saw that night might have felt like lightning in a bottle, but instead, it was the key. All right, it was the key to Pandora's box, baby, and I've opened it. And you can't close the box once it's been opened. So I, so I hear. There are tall whites ex bursting from this thing, like those freaking uh, fake jars of peanuts when you open the top and the snakes shoot out of it. What, what, a, what an ob obscure and outdated treat. To offer someone a, a tin of peanuts, <laughs> a tin of nuts. <laughs> like imagine going up to your friends now and be like, "Nut? Like, no, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm fine. What? They should have really. Please sample one of my nuts. They should have updated all of those. Yeah, for, for sure. Put it in a Harry Bow bag or something. Yeah, Kieran. Through your story, I've uncovered a whole new species of alien that I've never come across. It's an alien. It's an alien. How do you know this? Because you know who has come across it, kid. The US military. What? While these creatures may have been new to Scotland, <laughs> they are no strangers to Earth. In 1965, Vietnam veteran Charles Hall was working as a weather observer for the Air Force in Nevada. But why is it always <laughs> Nevada? God damn. Because that's the hub of it. That's what they like. They obviously like dusty, hot shit. So that's where they all go. <laughs> I guess they like <laughs> towns with all going on it seems weird like there's quite a lot of nice places to go on earth they only i know they, they they can travel across galaxies at the speed of light and yet looking down upon earth they see you know the bahamas yeah they see the beautiful uh great barrier reef yeah hawaii baby they, they see hawaii baby they see goddamn bali <laughs> and then they go nah this giant patch of dust that will do. But we don't know where they're coming from. They could come from Bali Planet. <laughs> <laughs> Hawaii'sville. It's just one big wave that you surf from sunrise to sunset while I'm you so, drink Corona. I'm so tired of surfing. I wish I was dead. <laughs> I just want to go see some dust. <laughs> A dream. Like heaven to them is, is the Sahara Desert. Yeah, yeah. Not a drop of water in sight. Oh, yeah. Dust in your eyes and your alien ass all over you. <laughs> Charles Hall was working as a weather observer for the Air Force in Nevada. But when his work began, surprisingly, he was given high-level clearance to Area 51, which he refers to as Dreamland. <laughs> I don't think that's his, I think that's a common nickname for it. Oh, he it's, didn't, he, he, it's all just his childhood dream to no. work there. Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> On top of this, Charles Hall was told that over the last seven years, 41 previous weather observers had been compromised. Some had required hospitalization, some were given medical discharges, and others had simply been killed. From that point forward, Charles Hall realized this job was not going to be what he thought it was. Well, it doesn't sound like dreamland to start, on account of all the nightmare experiences. I, well, I guess if you took a job as a weather observer, even if it was in Nevada, you wouldn't think to show up and someone like slaps on an Area 51 all access badge. You'd think there's been some sort of massive mistake. Yeah. Until they tell you, 
by the way, the last 40 weather observers all died. You know, he gets there first day. He's like, so um, where's your like observation deck where I can uh, work from? Uh, I'm sure you guys have got a lot of um, data analytics stuff I can take a look at. They're like, Charles, we actually have a, another thing uh, planned. We're going to drop you into the eye of Hurricane Dorian and you're going to observe what's going on. He's, he's like, uh, that's, I don't, I don't think that's what I, I just think there's been a mistake. You are a weather observer, are you not? <laughs> Don't be, don't be worried, uh, Charles. You'll be completely safe uh, behind the reinforced space deal of the alien craft. You, you knew aliens were real before today? Now? Did you, Charles? Did you, Charles? Did you really? Can you tell us your story of how you managed to come into contact with these beings as you worked with the military? I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I enlisted in the Air Force in July 1964, and I was trained as a weather observer. And I was sent to Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada, outside Las Vegas, Nevada. And I, for two and a half years, I was sent up to the gunnery ranges up at Indian Springs. And I was given a clearance to allow me to go anywhere, anywhere in dreamland uh, as long as I was alone. I discovered that up there at the north end of Indian Springs Valley, which you can see on the map in the state of Nevada here in America, that there was a base which the U.S. Air Force maintained mm -hmm. for a group of extraterrestrials who were tall and white. And I, as the duty weather observer, was allowed to go up there, or they were allowed to come down to where I was. And that the interaction took place over more than two years. Wow. During those two years, I also... I'm sorry. He was allowed to... He had access all areas as yeah. long as he was alone. It seems like the the absolute opposite of what it should be yeah usually you can't go anywhere unless no. you've got armed guards surrounded by you <laughs> listen charles don't even think of going into that alien base and doing whatever the f you want without <laughs> anyone being able to see maybe it was like he showed up and immediately within five seconds they realized that he was the most annoying person on earth and like everyone else there was like Oh my god, just here, slap, just go anywhere, go anywhere you want, just go by yourself, go anywhere. And Charles, he's, he's you know, page out of my book, he's like, are you sure you guys don't want to come with me? I just ordered several marble pizzas, I thought we could get to know each other. Oh god, go see the greys, go see, there's aliens in there, you never seen those before, just go, god damn it. I will say one thing that makes sense in all of this, is that, you know, me, and I'm sure many of our listeners are probably listening to this going, what business does a weather observer from the military have doing in uh, in Dreamland, an alien base? Um, but what do we know from previous investigations such as Roswell is that these events are always passed off as weather balloons. So who do you think works on weather balloons? But weather observers. Do I have to spell it out for all y'all? Weather balloon means giant UFO. I'm really glad and weather you observer means giant UFO observer. That was a huge leap, so I'm glad you did spell it out for us, because I don't think anyone, including me or our listeners, was gonna uh, make that assumption. So thank you for spelling it out. I also think, um, as we'll we'll learn, he was doing some weather observations, but it also kind of seemed like a lot of the people who have this role are just hired to kind of put in the same area as these aliens and see what happens <laughs> kind of like a big brother type scenario let's see what the aliens do to a barista <laughs> honestly i want to see what they do to a guy who could pull an espresso <laughs> they killed the doctors engineers and physicians so i was uh hired uh in the nevada starbucks um to be <laughs> the head barista i was given all access clearance for area 51 and dreamland <laughs> within five days i was making tall whites for tall whites <laughs> <laughs> and um <laughs> creating coffees that uh if humans drank them would uh make their brains melt from the inside out so obviously immediately after hearing all of this in this testimony i had to find out what the hell happened with charles he said he was working with these tall whites for years and he's written books on the experience called Millennial Hospitality. Now, a lot of this info that I got moving forward is from www.thinkaboutit-aliens.com. <laughs> 
I want to give them their proper credit. Even though Charles was still performing all his regular weather observation duties, he claimed he was almost continuously surrounded by a group of extraterrestrials watching him, observing him, even when he showered in the barracks. What? <laughs> they, they, so these they f- have free robe. Yeah. They can do whatever they... We're going to learn a lot about the movie. This before, is the but opposite <laughs> of everything we've heard about Area 51. I think the last oh, yeah. time we talked about Area 51 on this podcast... Um, it was being detailed that Bob Lazar, who claimed to have worked there for many years, said that he only got to look at alien crafts, I think, twice in his entire career. Oh, yeah. And otherwise, they were like, do not look at, do not touch anything. They were always uh, accompanied by armed guards. Yeah, it's a very different situation here. Because I think when you think about aliens in Area 51, you think, you know, in the test tubes, uh, surrounded by jelly. Yeah. Or like behind the glass or something. If you're working in these barracks, a, a tall white can come up, gank your wallet, laser gun off your kneecaps... And it's fair game. You I'm can't pre- do shit back to them. I'm pretty sure this is the headquarters of Will Smith's Men in Black movie, <laughs> where the aliens just <laughs> hang out in the canteen. Just chilling, yeah. The creatures were tall, white-skinned figures that Charles would come to learn were from another planet. But that's not all he would learn about them. Charles states in his books that the tall whites come to Earth only when the moon is full and the visibility at night is at its brightest on Earth. He believes that they've been here on Earth for tens of years, hiding amongst the desert bases with the US military, who provide them with a safe space to live. In fact, the military even constructed huge cement caves for the creatures to store their larger ships. These were built into the sides of the surrounding mountains. Charles also states that while their deep spacecrafts are massive, their smaller scout crafts are white and around the size of a bus or an RV. Despite the creatures being relatively peaceful, accidents would often happen at the base. I mean, if there's been 41 previous weather observers, you're gonna assume there is a occupational hazard out right, there because it's the middle of the desert let's be honest the weather isn't changing that much <laughs> no it's always dry and sunny it goes fine to sandstorm and back again that's the cycle of it all the tall whites were known for being particularly impulsive and would harm or kill with the slightest provocation charles wrote that every tall white adult carries a pencil like weapon <laughs> that by varying the frequency of focused microwaves Jesus. can stun, kill, or hypnotize humans. Definitely don't let them wander around the base with that. Well, you're not going to stop them, are you? I not with a f- space wand. They would often <laughs> use it to discipline anyone who annoys or frightens them. So you don't even have to do anything wrong if you just happen to surprise them? I think they are easily spooked as well. <laughs> These tall, gangly bastards. They're the worst people to own a weapon. They're kind of like if you gave a, a a gun to a cat. Right. Even if you loved the cat and the cat loved you, if you kind of came up behind and you were like, hey, mittens, it was like, wow. <laughs> if you spray, <laughs> spray and bullets as it turns, you know, the cat doesn't want to kill you, but you've, you've startled it. Yeah, I'm starting to understand the broader picture here. Despite working alongside them on a day-to-day basis, even Charles wasn't safe from their wrath. On one occasion, while he was alone with them in the desert, the creatures, without warning, blasted him in the neck. What? And left him to die. (laughs) This doesn't make any f***ing sense. Please show some respect to Charles and the story. And and you know what? Show some goddamn respect to Kieran, all right? Because he almost went toe-to-toe with these gangly motherf***. I don't think he did. He rat. He said his instinct kicked in and he sprinted at the first sight. I don't think he even saw it. I think he heard a wooden pallet being dragged and his instinct to sprint kicked in. I think that sound was actually the dragging of a wooden pen along the, the floor. Get ready to laser his nuts off, all right? <laughs> to hypnotize, then laser his nuts. I mean, I know there was no health and safety back then, but this yeah. is preposterous. No, I dis- I politely disagree. This is this is like starting a zoo in a major city, one in which the workers and wild animals simply coexist in the same space. No look, barriers. Look, the military let these guys do whatever they want, 
because I didn't want, we were going to get into it later on, but the main reason why this is happening is because the tall whites possess incredible technology, interstellar travel, anti-gravity okay. engines. Okay. The U.S. are kissy, kissy up to them. They don't want to piss <laughs> them off because they want this stuff. They want the, the space guns and the spaceships. Okay. So, you know, if they play nice, if they build them some caves in the mountains and let them laser whoever they want, you know, hire a couple more weather observers. Those guys are like I don't know if 10 this is, a penny. I don't know if this is how the military usually operates, though. Normally, if the U.S. wants something, they, they're usually like, let's go to war, kick their ass and take their shit. That's probably how it's they were going to do it until they found out about the magic pencils. Right, like Vietnam didn't have magic pencils at the time. Yeah, because this is 1965. Yeah. So we're still pretty far back in terms of the technology the military would have to deal with aliens. I guess. Despite being blasted in the neck, Charles managed to... I forgot that's where we were. <laughs> Charles managed to stop the bleeding and make it back to base safe. On another occasion, the tall white shot him, assuming that the wound would kill him. However, when he managed once again to recover, Charles said that their message was, We have power over you and expect you to die, but will applaud you if your tenacity and will to live allow you to pull through. <laughs> What? Uh, it was a, I think what they're saying it was is hazing. So we're going to try and kill you, but if you survive, we'll respect you. More or less. What? It's prison rules, all right? That's how it works. It's not prison. <laughs> it's a, it's a research facility. It's a workplace. I think they it's like a game to them. They're just <laughs> testing the the strength of humans and their will to live. So they kind of bam shot him, and then when he actually lived, they were like, "Oh, fair play." <laughs> That was our well done, Charles. We actually thought you were gonna die after the neck thing, but two for two. Are you gonna do it again? You're gonna shoot me a third time, probably. <laughs> Straight oh, his head. Oh, come on, guys! You shot me three times. You haven't shot Tony once. <laughs> we I like Tony. Tony. <laughs> Why? He brings us crackers. You uh, never asked me once for crackers. I would have brought you so many crackers if you had asked one time. I didn't even know you liked. Crackers. My medical bills are tens of thousands of dollars. I would, of course, buy you unlimited crackers. Silence, Charles. God, I'm sorry, Tony. He sometimes just like this. <laughs> <laughs> Munching a salt cracker. Tony, these are amazing as usual. Are all other humans as bitchy as this? Now, it's documented that the tall whites apparently come here only to repair their ships and allow their children to vacation in the hot desert Vacation? Sands. Yeah, the kids get to run, run so around. So there's tall white kids. Do tall, they have lasers as well? They're small whites, actually. Okay. <laughs> and no, they don't have their own. Well, actually, they it's, might. I don't know. It's actually the opposite of what you think. The taller they are, the younger they are. They get smaller <laughs> over time. They actually, I know, I know so much stuff now about these aliens. <laughs> They actually live to 800 years old. Okay. And the reason they die is because their body, they grow so tall, but the organs inside their body uh, doesn't grow and expand with their height. So they eventually die of organ failure around uh, 800 years this old. This is so dumb. It's, it's insanely bizarre. Also, the tall white mothers claimed essentially nonstop that they love their children so much more than any earth mother ever could. <laughs> and if you want to get a conversation with a tall white off on the right step, you would say like, hello, you love your children more than us humans. We were wondering if, and then you would ask whatever, and they'd be like, yeah, you're goddamn right. What? Yeah, so I know so much stuff about these guys. It's real weird. It's th these tall white are just rich hippie moms kind of yeah what? that's the vibe i'm getting well anyway they let their children vacation in the hot desert sands but according to charles they also like to gamble in las vegas and allegedly they would put on human this makeup and ridiculous. and wigs to go <laughs> seven foot white tolls put on <laughs> makeup and th and that's fine they just walk right on into caesar's palace this is <laughs> stupid i actually have a picture here what if you want to see it uh, there's no way these guys are getting into a casino 
<laughs> so that's kind of what they look like with some clothes and hair on. Okay, so I don't really know where to begin. I mean, they're just like, think of like a really, really creepy, like Swedish family uh, with like long blonde hair and pale white skin. But then add in some alien eyes, alien mouth. And then for some reason, they're wearing like white roll necks. <laughs> it's not even human clothes. It, but, but it looks like a little sweater or something. I guess, yeah. They have alien eyes. Yo, they're yeah. not human eyes, they're giant they're, bug they're eyes. They're aliens. They're straight up aliens. I don't know if they wore masks. I'm not sure if they can sort of rearrange the shapes of their faces to be more like a human. But apparently, according to Charles, who, as we know, did live with them for a number of years. And they like to gamble. <laughs> they like to gamble with their space bucks. If you, yeah, it'd be really... Because even if you did dress them up like humans, make them look like humans, capable of speaking English, then they sit down at the high-stakes blackjack table and put down, like, a fistful of slime on the counter because that's their money. There's so many things that you wouldn't think to address before you put them into a casino yes i mean take the pens off them as well yeah i think what i'm starting to understand is according to charles these pens are obviously much more persuasive than i am giving them credit maybe these tall whites are pulling some darren brown shit like they just <laughs> hypnotize everyone around them yeah so, so the darren brown made a video where he went into a jeweler bought like thousands of pounds worth of shit and then paid for it with blank pieces of paper. What? Is that real? Yeah, you can watch it on YouTube. It's nuts. And he does this in a bunch of different shops and jewelers. Pa <laughs> just pays with blank pieces of paper. And then what? it takes the bag. He's like, thanks, walks out. And then about 20 seconds later, they realize what's happened. They run out and they're like, whoa, where'd he go? <laughs> we're going to watch that clip back and we're going to be like, never realized Darren Brown was seven foot tall, ice white hair down to his shoulders. I think he actually just killed the jeweler with a pen. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the jewels. I like gambling and I like jewels. <laughs> These are the trashiest aliens. Now I get it, all right? All of this sounds pretty crazy. Aliens living alongside the US Air Force? I mean, that's one of the m probably most plausible things I've said. But maybe, Kit, we have more evidence on this case than we thought we did. While investigating the site on Google Earth, YouTuber David Hilton made some incredible discoveries. This is some fantastic uh, armchair investigation. Uh, a YouTuber Google mapping the base. All right. So look, sometimes you don't have to go out in the world to find the best paranormal evidence. What are you going to do? Walk on up and get penciled by one of these whites? Exactly. That's, that's when they get you. I'm safe in my room. All right. You know who did some pretty good shit sitting down? Poirot. Columbo. Did he? I feel like he was always walking about. I'm pretty sure Sherlock people. Holmes never left the goddamn house. Uh, definitely not true. He sent Watson out for snacks, but he would do... <laughs> he did most of the work from his so Watson chair. Watson didn't even go anywhere. Watson just... Watson. Pretty sure he got Watson to wipe his ass for him <laughs> because he didn't want to move. I had an interest in the story of Charles Hall and the tall whites for a number of years. After reading his book, Millennial Hospitality, I was trying to locate the positioning of the weather stations on the bombing and gunnery ranges that he talks about in his book so that I could better understand the orientation of the various locations. While conducting my research, I ran across this photo at OpenSETI.org. I then went into Google Earth to locate some of the positions to get a, a closer look. What caught my interest in this photo are the sites marked at the top center of the picture that was labeled Scoutcraft Hangar and Resting and Play Area. I wanted to get a good look at those areas in Google Earth. When I looked at those areas, what I found was shocking. Before I go on, I want to make everyone aware of Charles Hall's description of the tall white Scoutcraft. Here's an image of it. Looks like an egg. Look at that. It appears to be three structures that seem to fit the description of the scout craft as described by Charles Hall. Okay. Furthermore, right above them is what appears to be a recreation area of some sort that is located on the top of a hill with no apparent access roads or paths whatsoever. All right, kids, so our first clue, our first piece of discovery is what is essentially 
an image on Google Maps that shows three of the tall white scout crafts okay. sitting okay. on top of the mountain. Okay. Okay. Those eggs are from another universe. Okay, let's just be clear. Crystal, baby, let's go. I admire what this investigator is doing. This is actually pretty cool because Google, as we're seeing on the screen here, Google Maps is actually pretty sophisticated now. It's He can kind of do a 3D model of the landscape, which is pretty nuts. Yeah. So it's not just top down. What I will say is those eggs if that's what they are, are very, very far away. Like those could be, that could be. What do you mean? What's, what's that? What else is it going to be? That could be a, that could be three port lined up. That could be. In the middle that, of nowhere? In the middle of the, the well, mountains yeah, in the Nevada desert? Three eggs lined up <laughs> in the middle of nowhere? Space scout crafts, please. They could be uh, like weather stations. They could be, uh, they, I don't know. They could be a bunch of things. I mean, I'll give it to him. He's found in the area, he's found something that could, could match the description. Also, this recreation area, I mean, there's just a tennis court on top of a mountain with no <laughs> path to it. I mean, that's paranormal in itself. That is, I, I don't really get that the aliens would have any interest in like a, what looks like a, a astroturfed kind of play area. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what that is. Yeah. I'll be blunt with you. The scout craft egg vehicles, sure, I know what that is. Yeah. I don't know what the, what the orange square is at all. I don't really, also, it's on top of a massive mountain range i don't see why they would need a, a rectangular play area on a mountainside yeah we can't stress how isolated this is <laughs> it's no it's in the middle of nowhere there's nothing honestly miles. nowhere yeah. that is very strange so david hilton with this information and those coordinates actually contacted uh the air force and under the freedom of information act requested any insight as to what these objects were what was the reasoning behind it why they were there and um, he did actually get a response. First off, they claimed that he wasn't being clear enough, even though he included the coordinates, mm. a link to the Google Maps window where you could actually see it. Uh, and then after that, they responded saying, just, you know, the Freedom of, Infor the Freedom of Information Act uh, is in regards to documents and releasing documents. It doesn't mean we have to tell you what whatever you want. <laughs> You can't say like our all aliens. information <laughs> should be free. I mean, it's weird that they declined to uh, tell him what it was. It's kind of like going to your local restaurant and then putting like uh, a, like a, a cool sauce on the burger, and then you contacting the government and being like, "What are the ingredients in the sauce?" In the secret sauce, and then being like, "That's that's not really our freedom of information act." No, okay, that's... what spices are in KFC chicken? <laughs> That's not really our remit. Tell me! <laughs> Which is a pretty cool loophole for the government, because if they don't make a document about it, they don't have to say shit. Yeah, it's all verbal. All right, so that was the first weird thing uh, that he noticed. Here's the second. Further research that I've done has revealed some other interesting facts. There were multiple nuclear tests in the mid to late 1960s that were done in the general area of the reported tall white underground base facility. Note that in this image, the nuclear tests are in the order of their location from north to south in the test area. It should be noted that one of the original points of research in nuclear testing was its application in civil engineering and underground excavation. Could these tests be an indication of underground construction? Also, there were three earthquakes in the general area. In 1963, at 4.1 magnitude, 15.53 miles deep. In 1968, at 3.6 magnitude, at 20.51 miles deep. And in 1987, at 3.6 magnitude, at 24.30 miles deep. Also, on the far side of the valley, in the same area of the previously mentioned scout craft, there were 10 earthquakes ranging from 3.0 to 4.1 magnitude, dating from 1952 to 1999 almost all of which were at 3.73 miles in depth. Again, could these be an indication of underground construction? Now, we already heard from Charles Hall in his testimony that the government was working with the tall whites to construct underground layers and bases where they could store their 
main spacecrafts. What we're seeing here is very similar sized earthquakes at the same depth down into the earth consistently in the same areas over a huge period of time. That's pretty interesting, but what's he inferring? That that somehow their underground construction is causing an earth causing regular earthquakes? I think so, yeah. Whether it's like, I don't know how you make underground bases, but I assume it's explosions. Blowing yeah. out walls. Drilling, yeah, for sure. That sort of thing. I mean, I don't know anything about how you cause earthquakes. All I know is that through fracking, they've definitely caused earthquakes before. Um, and they probably are on that kind of order of magnitude. They're pretty small. So, I, like, it is possible to cause earthquakes through man-made means. Yeah, through either fracking or the departure of a, of a large interstellar vehicle bursting out of the earth and back into space. Okay, I mean, Either one would probably cause the Earth to shake a little bit, to quiver. Why not? It's terrifying. <laughs> you think there's earthquakes because the Earth is scared? It's shitting itself. Global warming? Natural disasters? I'd be scared too. I'm like a frickin' nine on the Richter scale. In no way how it works. Like a nine is like a massive geological shift under miles underneath the Earth's crust. Mother Earth is a single mother, all right? And it's worried about the sustainability and the future. I'd be shaken to my to my core, to my freaking mantle, if I was Mother Earth. So it all makes sense. And what we're seeing here is earthquakes in this area around the time where Charles claims that there are tall whites on the base. Red flags, Kit. That's all I'm saying. Red flags. So weird that out of this entire argument, the bit that you don't grasp is earthquakes. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, so coming down on a yes or no, are earthquakes paranormal? <laughs> Is the world shaking because it's scared of the future? You're like, what? Why don't we talk about tall whites for an hour? That's just basic science. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I'm bombarding you with facts and logic. And I feel like you're just not open. You're just, I felt like you came at this case with a no. That's that's completely unfair. I'm ready to believe this case, but you've also thrown me that these aliens are here to gamble, uh, play tennis, and they fly here in egg crafts. <laughs> and they can kill. They're like James Bond. They have a license to kill whoever they want. And they're, they ain't afraid to use it. And they speak English. And they 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 get have mad. a they have a device that enables them to speak English and translate. Their their actual voice apparently sounds like dogs barking. Okay. So it's a little weird. And, and they apparently love their kids more than you. Well, they say they get mad if you in if you in that they love their kids less than yeah love they keep kids. talking about how much they love their kids but i haven't seen their kids in a really long time they just kind of let them wander off in the desert thoughts um might i remind you that anything you say could directly insult kieran one of our listeners listen i'm on board with what what, what happened to kieran i know that kieran's a trustworthy guy yeah. i know that in fact all the people we talked about with that first hand account of what happened to them I knew that they saw what they saw. Any guy who goes to the gym at 2 a.m., marble pizza's on me, all right? Because I'm pretty sure it's just him and Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Yeah. That's a really interesting sighting, and I'm really glad that he sent that in to us. Um, and there's actually a lot of interesting information here. Um, you know, the, he what this gentleman on YouTube is explaining to us is a mix of kind of speculation with recorded facts that we do know there were a number of nuclear tests in this area that we know there are. Air Force bases in this area. He's got Google Maps up for Christ's sake. He, we know that that tennis court and the egg-shaped objects are there. Yeah. But my problem is the extrapolation with what Charles is saying. Because what Charles is saying is a little hard to believe. It is, yeah. Given that it's being purported by one person alone. So Charles wrote, uh, I, I believe, three books on his experience. Sorry, maybe four in total. Three or four books with the first of the series being a fictionalized retelling of the events that took place, and then the final book revealing it was all fact. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. I think his his uh, explanation was that, you know, I knew no one would believe me anyway, so I wrote the, the, the true stories claiming they were fiction. Okay, that's quite a bombshell, to be honest. Yeah. Because I don't think it counts as fictionalizing the story if it was fiction to begin with. I think... <laughs> 
<laughs> I think you could say that he factualized the third book. <laughs> right, right, yeah. You're kind of being bombarded from all sides here. You know, you got uh, this guy, uh, David Hilton, providing you with dates, times, measurements, locations, coordinates, facts. It's And it's great. It's everything that we love in a paranormal case. Yeah. And, you know, we have um, Charles Hall, who, you know... He's a reasonably solid guy, served as a soldier, served as a weather observer. As far as I know, all those records clear out. He did work on the base at this time. Um, he was working in the area. As we know, there was suspicious stuff happening. But then it veers a little too far, um, where I think some of the fictionalized novel enters in with the magic pen that can do anything. Apparently. Charles claiming that he was almost killed twice, but was tough enough to live through it. So he earned the, the White's respect. Um, and there's there's so much more that I haven't explained. And I know that we love a paranormal story when it includes uh, a lot of detail, because that helps <laughs> legitimize a story. But when you reach the amount of detail that I found in Charles Hall's story, yeah. it, it goes from straight from... Uh, doesn't sound real to, oh, he's mentioning some very specific things, very interesting, to basically a diary of living with aliens nonstop, yeah. and it becomes so hyper-specific that it it's almost too strange, too, too much to believe. Yeah, so specific, yet none of it really adds up. Like, the idea of these whites just living amongst the soldiers at Area 51 with absolutely no restrictions or oversight as to how many people they kill on a daily basis yeah yeah again i believe it was because um okay so you believe it then well no i'm just saying if this did happen charles says it's because the u.s military wanted alien technology um and they were so they basically let the tall whites have free reign over what ever they wanted you know they could walk into the canteen like pick up a diet coke pop it right there and chug you know don't pay for it throw the can at some like the captain's head but what is and that he has to be like thank you for the tin sir <laughs> what is that negotiation? you love your child more than i ever could <laughs> what does that negotiation look like the aliens are like listen we'll show you the pen if we get to to literally whatever the f we want killing your people shitting all over them taking whatever we want when we want and who signs off on that the goddamn president you and i both know that the u.s military has done way worse all right they would they would nuke half the country for an alien pebble all right so it's not outside the realms of possibility that's all i'm saying that being, yet, said, <laughs> that being said this week it is a no, no from me um now to be clear that is a no to um the this very specific story of Charles Hall living with the alien greys in the uh, Nevada desert. That's fair. This isn't a no to um, anything paranormal happening at these sites because it sounds like there is some weird stuff going on. And this definitely isn't a no to uh, Kieran and his experience that he mentioned because that sounds like while there is a lot of similarities between what he saw and the tall whites, I mean the tall whites had faces they could talk they weren't right. kind of like these yeah. all white humanoids maybe there's a bit of crossover but who knows the universe is a weird place guys it's big and it's weird so kieran i'm sorry that was the best research i could do i hope you find answers one day and i hope you enjoyed this week's episode of this paranormal life Another great week, another great paranormal investigation. Folks, if you want to email in your own suggestions so we can talk about it on the podcast, email them into thisparanormallifepodcast at gmail.com. Or you know what? Don't do that. Why don't you come <laughs> what? Why don't you come tell us it in person at the This Paranormal Life live show? Oh, even better. It's gonna be the night you don't wanna miss. It's going to be an incredible show, folks. You don't want to miss it. And we're going to be there all night afterwards, hanging out with everyone, talking about the paranormal. So if you do want to come to that, it is, let's do, I'll do one bit of the event and then like a playful, then you can do the other bit. Okay. So sure. I'll be like, sounds good. Sunday, the 15th of September. You took mine, buddy. I was going to go for, uh, I was going to go for September. Now I'm thrown. See, well, I mean, so you know, it's. 20 surely you know 20 do you know the time just say what time it is what time it is what time 
come see it at okay fine uh half nine half nine nine thirty p.m nine thirty p.m um uh at the so all you know is that it's you're just asking the, you're, you're just asking me where it's at, at no this we're point. doing like a, a we're telling the information okay part. fine so at the king's place theater king's and the, place. in the year you don't know what year it is i'm just we're doing like a bouncy no okay thing. i'll go in the year of no i threw you it have back to say to what you. year I threw it back absolutely to you. Absolutely not how it works. <laughs> what do you mean? I absolutely not how it works. I don't think you understand how this works. I think I'm just gonna okay. ask you point blank at this point. What year do you think the live show is happening? Irrelevant. In? All right. Irrelevant. I don't need, I don't, I I don't need to answer that. Irrelevant. I don't. It, I'm being put on blast here. I'm trying to plug my. I'm trying to plug my own. So live you said show. it was just around the corner. Come see us. Yeah. As soon as possible. Yeah. What year? Well, it's it's this one. Yeah. Which is the year. 20 and then i throw okay, to you so you know it's 20 and then i throw to you okay come see us on the year 20 i'll do the next digit so 20 20 and then there's a one yeah and then to you the last digit which is and that's not how I it threw works it you can't you. throw you it back to me <laughs> i threw it to you so you Holy can do the last shit. digit look guys it doesn't matter what year it is you already know the date, the time, and the place. And you already know it's going to be the best night that you don't want to miss. So come and watch this Paranormal Life Live. I don't want to give, I don't want to spoil the, 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 the event for you folks. But we're going to do some dark magic. <laughs> There's going to be some twisted stuff going on that you don't want to miss. So come along to that. It's going to be amazing. This Paranormal Life Live, Sunday, 15th, 2019. <laughs> If you can't make it to the live show, but you still want more of this paranormal life, hey, don't sweat it. I know how we can help you out. On our Patreon, you can get access to bonus content. I think we're coming up to 30 episodes of bonus content. What? That from as little as five bucks a month, you can get access to the entire backlog. Every single day for a full month, you could listen to this Paranormal Life bonus episodes. You never even get sick of it. So check that out. Because if you do support us on Patreon, what we like to do is also give you a little shout out right here on the podcast. So thank you to William Boyce. William Boyce as the voice of God. This Ooh. is that guy who does all the ads for movies. Oh yeah. In a world. In a world. Filled with flying monkeys. He's like 95 f-ing years old. Wow. He's old as hell. He's only getting better now because now he's like, he can do the wizard voice where it's like, in a world. <laughs> you know, because he's so old and aged. Unfortunately, he got one line in Lord of the Rings. Fly, you fools. Yeah, he dubbed that, they dubbed that in. That was it. But fun- thankfully, that paid for his entire retirement. Thanks for your support. Thanks also to Elliot Spirit. Elliot, you keep my spirits high and my spirits are never dry. That's right. Rum, whiskey, tequila. The whole party is there when you're around, brother. So grab a couple bottles and let's become spirits. I want to drink till we die. I think he has a drinking problem, to be honest. Oh, well, he, he's always like, even if it's like the middle of the day, he's already, he's been on it since his spirits. His spirits are high. Started it's with a- some beerios, worked his way through lunch. I asked him what he was doing the other day at 11 a.m., drunk off his ass. He said, there's no laws when you're drinking claws. <laughs> uh, so you keep saying it's a curse, but uh, it's not. It's it's actually a, quite a serious affliction that we can't help you with. Thanks also to Emily Carey. Emily's always there to carry you home after you've had a late night of too many Lombardies. When the liquid of the dead turns your legs into liquid lead, <laughs> Jesus, you you can't walk home. She's there. She car- carrying you home right on her shoulders wow. like an angel. That's so thank amazing. you. Thank you. She is expensive though. She does. Bill, oh, it's an Uber service. You, yeah. It's an yeah. Uber. It's a full on Uber service. Yeah. And I'm an XL man. I need the space. And no, I will not pool. <laughs> I, want the, I want the ride to myself. Thanks also to Nick Murr. If it isn't Tricky Nicky. <laughs> He's a little bit like a modern day Robin Hood because he steals from the rich and gives to the more. What? He just steals from the oh, rich and gives, keeps gives it. Uh, he doesn't really give it away, but they, they all call him Tricky Nicky because uh, he's pretty sticky. He can climb up walls. He's a bit like a Spider Man as well. Um, Judging by his this thumbnail of his. He's tiny. He, 
He's, I think he's an insect of some kind. He's very small. Because he can't, the walking out the walls thing was a dead giveaway. Yeah, oh, 100%. He's he's more spider than, than man, really. Ah, and when good. I say he steals from the rich, we're talking pennies at a time, because anything more would just crush his little insect body. Oh, <laughs> so he is an insect. He's a bug, yeah, he's an actual bug. <laughs> Thanks. They also call him Ticky Nicky. Because <laughs> ah. he's a f Tick. That's actually way more descriptive. I should have I should have led with that. Because he is tricky, but he's also mostly a tick. Yeah. Thanks also to Hannah O'Connell. Hannah is borderline obsessed with iguanas. They borderline. call her Iguana Hannah. You you go to a party and it's all she wants to talk about. Fact after fact of of iguana facts. Is there, is there that many facts to begin with? 100%. Number one, they like it hot and sticky. That's... Okay, that's barely a <laughs> that's fact. That's just a fact about them. Okay, it's barely a fact, though. Number two, they shed skin. Okay, fine. Every, pretty much every animal sheds skin. Did you also know they're crazy about veggies? Kind of every animal is crazy. Do like you know they, they have like an veggies. extra eye? What? They have an extra eye. I don't know if that's true, <laughs> which I think a fact has to be. Do you know they can breathe fire Okay. They when can't. provoked? No, no, they can't. All right. Actually, and they can f***ing talk to each other. Are these Hannah's via facts? Via their eye. Because you're just making them up at this point. Sometimes I'll make up facts to fit in with Hannah, because she has all the facts. I don't actually know shit about anything. Okay. So I'll just, she'll say one as well, and I'm like, yeah, they also have four vaginas, um, just to try and like... But you shouldn't do to Hannah because Hannah objectively knows more about iguanas than anyone else. We don't talk much anymore, okay. me and Hannah. Yeah. Thanks also to John. John, you know you sound like you sound like you're a cool, strong guy. Right. You've only given us your first name, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna make up your second name right here on the podcast, John. Let's go for it. John Mountain Decker. Nice. Like he punches mountains. That's a pretty strong name, actually. John. Should we go middle name? Monkey Decker. Okay. He straight up beat the king of the jungle. I think... What did you say? Mountain Decker? I think that was almost better. Mountain Decker rather than Monkey Decker. John Horse Strangler. Okay, these are less and less you're, like you're, names. You're, you're, you're killing the fastest animal on the horse track. I was going to say... <laughs> <laughs> they're not the fastest animal. No, not in the jungle, but on the horse course. Yeah, they're pretty damn fast. And they're not fast in the jungle because, well, the jungle's a thicket. There's no way that lanky <laughs> bastard's making it through the jungle at any time. So, John, we give you a couple options there. Uh, mountain puncher, monkey puncher, or horse strangler, whichever one you want to go for. Uh, they're all pretty cool. Thanks also to Alex Atke. Has anyone seen Alex Atke? Because he has Ducky for the paranormal commune. Uh, we're all locked out. It's it. We all went out for ice cream, and Alex was the only one that we left with a key. It's a 2,000 acre compound, which very much comes to a bottleneck at the front <laughs> door, which is just one f lock. But yeah, just one lock. And you don't want to try and sneak into the paranormal commune, okay? Because it's guarded by horses, oh, the fastest course. creature on the horse course. They will catch up to you even if you're fast. And the, if the commune, if nothing else, is a course for horses. So if anyone can find Alex, uh, just give us a heads up. Thanks also to Joe Hannasberg. Uh-oh. Watch out, Titanic. We're dealing with the Johan Iceberg. Whoa. It is tiny up top, but thick down below. You think it's just a tiny little icy peak, but there is you think Mount you, Kilimanjaro you think below. You can smash right through it, but oh no, no, no. They're unbreakable, and they'll sink your little ship of rich people. Yeah, they said it was uh, that the ship could not sink. It was unsinkable uh, until it meets an unmeltable Asberg. <laughs> Johan Asberg. Thanks also to David King. David showed up at the commune and thought he'd be the king. He didn't realize, uh-oh, the roles are reversed in this place. The peasants rule the commune. The kings serve the gruel. So, sorry David, but you're on cleanup duty from now to infinity. Because that's also how it's handed out. We're the paranormal peasants and we rule this land. Like kings. <laughs> Sure, I, I understand and can acknowledge the irony in that statement. 
that, you know, yes, we are the peasants, but also we're the kings. Nay, gods of this world. Nay, kings. Stick with kings. I prefer kings. And the gods, they serve us. <laughs> Because it's opposite world. And the gods, peasants, which make them super gods. And we bow down to them. But David, I'm sorry. You know, if you lose the king, maybe we can swap up your roles a little bit. Sure. But until then, it's shoeshine duty. Oh shit, he just changed his name to David Chimney Sweep. I bowed down to thee, David. <laughs> You are my master now. Thanks also to Jason Slaybar. Jason Slaybar. Hope you like manual labor. <laughs> because in the paranormal commune, there is plenty to go around, my friend. Not for us, the peasants. We are the kings. But you, you peasant, <laughs> will be king among men, which makes you, again, a peasant. I can't be more clearly, I can't be more clear when describing the systematic <laughs> ruling. <laughs> can't even say that sentence right. Look, the roles of the commune change daily. It's pretty much whoever wakes up first can do whatever they want. <laughs> For infinity. <laughs> Forever. So I hope you enjoy your stay. Thanks also to Dave Lavasky. Dave Lavasky actually gets his name from um, his ancient ancestors. It's really all there in the name. They ski on lava. Lava, lava ski. ski. Wow. Pretty badass bunch of dudes. That was incredibly badass. Yeah. So he's obviously come from a line of very heroic, brave men and women. Right, right, right. But he's very much the black sheep in that family. Oh. He can't ski to save his life. Oh. He's he's the kind of guy, he eats a banana and he complains it's too spicy. So he's not going near any lava or anything hot. Right, right. You could say he's a bit of a peasant in that regard. Dave Lavasky, I gotta ask you, how do you feel about hard manual labor, you king? Which makes you a peasant, all right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's a paranormal commune. It's gonna be hard labor, but you know it's re it's a, re <laughs> it's, a re <laughs> it's a very rewarding process. Makes you feel like a king. <laughs> it's very rewarding for the like, kings of the commune. <laughs> if you didn't know by now, there's only two sections of the commune. It's kings and peasants. <laughs> there's absolutely zero in between. Uh, uh, no. Thank you. Lastly, but not leastly, to day one listener Joshua Cabrera. Joshua Cabrera, I don't want to scare you, but the commune is essentially a sweatshop. We, yeah. are, it's a prison yard, all right? And you are a, you are the servant to the peasants, right. which makes you a goddamn king. But to the peasants, which makes you a god. Are you getting it? Or am I, you, is he making this clear? You run the garment district. There's, there's no other way of saying it. You run it. You are the leader, which makes you, unfortunately, a peasant. Um, it's a cruel world where your roles can flip on a, the, the flick of a coin, my friend. But the beautiful thing is, tomorrow morning, you wake up early enough, <laughs> that coin can flip to the other side, my friend. So I hope you're having a great stay at the commune. So thank you so much to everyone who listened to the podcast and supports us on Patreon. Honestly, we just couldn't do it without you and you make all of this possible. Um, I'm probably going to go run like a 10K or something because I feel like I feel like I've never been better in my life. You're on the floor, sir. You're yeah, on the floor. Sure. I'm just regaining energy right now uh, and before my 10K. <laughs> I think I'm gonna set like a PR or something. So, um, so sorry. You're, you're I, crying. I just blacked out for a second. Um, thank you for listening to this week's episode. I don't think you should uh, go anywhere. I think you this should stay paranormal put. life. I need to see a doctor. Um, I'm gonna, pff, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go for a run. I'm gonna go for a run. I'm gonna okay, lift some weights. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, your feet are blue. Who, who knows? Who knows? I can't see. What do you so. mean? Who knows? <laughs> I can't see shit, so I don't know. They could be they could be on fire for all I know, because they're numb too. They're numb too, Kit. Probably because so they're blue. Might be part of the blueness. I'm gonna run to a hospital. How about that? I'll meet you in the middle, brother. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's episode of This Paranormal Life. Hopefully see a bunch of you guys at the live show. It's gonna be so much fun. And if not, Woo. we'll see you next Tuesday for a brand new paranormal tale. Bye-bye, folks. Bye.